get ready for the how does it work kind of talk. And for me, this is the most crucial part. So please welcome Eduardo Vacchi, who will tell us about WebAssembly. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to WebAssembly from the inside out. So, a couple of words about me. Um, my name is Eduardo Vacchi. You can find me with that handle pretty much everywhere. Um, well, currently I'm working for Tetrate, um, but during my work life I was able to do more or less often uh, what, what I really like, which is working with languages. Did research at the University of Milan, work in Unicreative Research and Development Group, work at Red Hat on Drools, which is a ruleless engine. Now in Tetrate I'm working on a WebAssembly runtime, which is pretty cool. I'm going to tell you about WebAssembly and about this runtime. So first, an introduction to WebAssembly. What is WebAssembly? So, uh, as you know, browsers are everywhere, and pretty much the best way, well, the easiest way to deliver software to clients. But uh, nowadays, the, the, I mean, for, for a few years, for a lot of years, the best way to deliver software to browsers was writing JavaScript, or targeting JavaScript as a compiler target. And, I mean, that works. We're still doing it, but it's not the best target that there is. If you want to do applications that are performant, um, well, it, has, it works, but it has some downsides. So WebAssembly was created to be a better compilation target to generate, and, and you can generate efficient code. I mean, the goal is to be able to generate efficient code using any language and compiler. So, uh, in general, it's a safe, portable, low-level code format that's designed for efficient execution and compact representation. Uh, yeah, so that you can actually have high-performance application on the web. However, it does not make any specific assumptions about browsers. The thing is, you can actually run WebAssembly applications outside the browser. And that's actually the part that it's most interesting to me. Um, and I think it's going to interest you as well. Uh, so inside the browser, where would you want to use WebAssembly? Well, for instance, applications such as games, where there are tight CPU-bound operations, GPU-bound operations, CPU especially, um, simulations like Google Heart, it's when it's being used. So these are the kind of applications that are heavy in CPU and computations where WebAssembly shines in the browser. But what about outside the browser? Well. The cool part about the WebAssembly VM is that it's very bare bone. It's simple, it's limited, and it's small. So you can actually embed it inside other programs to allow uh, anybody to target it as a compil compilation target and then run code, uh, code uh, um, inside a sandbox. So, and it's also fast to boot. So where it is used? There are quite a few use cases. I'm mentioning a few. Uh, Multi-platform development, for instance, on mobile. I mean, if you want to do a mobile, applic mobile application, runs in a browser or on a uh, uh, mobile platform. But, but also, uh, imagine you want to do cloud functions, like uh, k-native functions. Instead of doing a container, you could use a WebAssembly VM to run the code inside of it. And, and have a much smaller footprint. Uh, or plugins. This is actually the most uh, immediate use case. Imagine that you have an application that is hard to recompile and rebuild, and you want to give your users, uh, your end users, capability to uh, the capability to extend this application. Let's see an example here. Um, Envoy is a network proxy. It's written in C++, and um, it has the ability for you to compose filters. These filters manipulate data as it comes in, and so, and then you can decide to propagate it, change it, whatever. This filter comes as pre-built. Uh, inside the, the main binary of the, of the Envoy uh, network, an uh, Envoy proxy. Uh, and, and then you can compose this pre-built filter, but you may want to write your own. Now, what can you do? Well, you could write them using the native language for Envoy, which is C++, but then you may need to rebuild the binary for it. Now, so imagine that you have both uh, some support from a vendor you definitely, they definitely don't want you to rebuild their binary because they are vetted it, they are uh, audited it. So that's a nightmare from a security and auditing perspective. So what you can do instead is using some scripting language, like browsers with JavaScript instead of plugins. So what they did, what, what you do in Envoy, you have Lua. You can write scripts using Lua. These can be dynamically loaded. 
um, and, and then you run your Lua code in a sandbox, you don't have to rebuild the binary for Envoy, it runs in a safe space. However, now your end users have the same issue that uh, people have with browsers. You have to learn that scripting language. So WebAssembly is a perfect candidate because it's a VM, so your language, um, your executable code as a user and runs in a sandbox, but you're not forced to use the language that the uh, authors of the program decided to you to use. Like it's not you're not forced to use Lua. You can use whatever is able to compile to WebAssembly. So I wanted to show you a few other projects, just a few that are in the CNCF landscape. Um, Mazen, for instance, is a lesser-known network proxy, but it's similar to Envoy conceptually. It's written in Go. Kubernetes, of course, you know, but um, uh, there's an experiment to bring a custom scheduling within Kubernetes. Um, and uh, uh, the thing that actually uh, is common between all of these projects is that they're all written in Go, and the they support WebAssembly extensions using Wazero. Now, it's not that I want to pitch Wazero. There's a precise reason why Wazero is a better fit for these projects that are written in Go. I'm going to explain later. So how does WebAssembly look like? Well, so let's suppose that you have this ugly looking function. Uh, no? OK. Uh, well, I guess you can read it anyway. Uh, the, you have this function uh, written in assembly script. It's, um, uh, assembly script is a dialect of TypeScript. Um, and, well, it looks pretty much what you would expect it would look like. Uh, you have A, which is an integer, B, it's, you know, it's an integer, the subtraction function just computes a subtraction return result. The reason I decided to use assembly script is that it compiles to very neat and easy to understand assembly. Uh, in particular, you can recognize at the bottom there's the sub opcode in the assembly that's generated. We're going to focus and learn about this later more, but just to give you an idea. So this WebAssembly module can be then loaded inside a WebAssembly VM. In the case of your browser, through JavaScript, so that JavaScript boilerplate loads the subtraction operation and does it inside in the browser window and prints the results on the on the, on the document, and at the bottom you can see there's an example using Go, because that's for zero, uh, but you could use, I don't know, Rust and uh, Wasm Time or Wasm or there are a bunch of different WebAssembly runtime, and the boilerplate would be pretty much the same. So you can invoke the WebAssembly function regardless if it's in the browser or outside the browser, and the result is the same. So uh, modules, so when the, the unit of deployment for WebAssembly are modules, and modules are all about functions. So you can export functions and, and import functions. Exported functions are those that are defined with that mo within that module, and imported functions are defined somewhere else, and you expect them to be available at some point. So for instance, suppose that you have this other example in assembly script. At the top, you have this use add function that expecting some add function to be available. This is defined externally, declare add external. And in the assembly, uh, in the web assembly, you can see the exact correspondence between these directives. We're going to see later why these are necessary and useful. But that's, uh, that's just basically what you would do in web assembly. You can import function, export functions, and then the exported function can be called externally, and that's it. So the WebAssembly uh, VM, as I said, is bare bone, is limited, is, is small, and you can embed it easily, but it also comes, I mean, with, a, with, with limitation, of course, because, for instance, there's no standard library. That's why you want to definitely import functions externally. Um, so because there's no standard library, uh, there's no, for instance, there's no way to interact directly with the operating system, like uh, opening a file, writing a file. So there is a set of uh, predefined extensions, predefined uh, interfaces that are being uh, specified and discussed upon and st eventually standardized. Um, they are called WASI, WebAssembly System Interface. This allows your WebAssembly module to bypass, uh, like any glue code, for instance, uh, bypass the browser and run externally from the browser, but interact directly with the operating system. For instance, opening files, opening sockets, whatnot. Uh, the difference with it is similar to a POSIX layer, uh, like operating system primitives, but the difference is that um, it's sandboxed. That means that basically um, you cannot just interact with any part of the system. It gets a view of it, like you get a view of the file system, it gets a view of the networking, so it's safer than executing native code directly. There are many programming languages that are able to target WASM. Know why sometimes? Okay, uh, they are able to target Wasm. Some as a compilation target, and some of them are a build their runtime into Wasm and then run in interpreted mode. So there's C, C++, there's Rust, there's Go and Tiny Go, there's Zig, 
And then there's a few others that are running that can publish their interpreter. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tiny Go and Go, uh, because Go is the language was it was written in, but just to give you an example. So TinyGo is probably the most widely known uh, tool chain for compiling tiny, um, for targeting tiny devices, like embedded devices. And it was one of the first that was able to target WebAssembly. This is an example of a hello world using TinyGo. It produces small executables and is able to target WASI as an API. But starting with Go 121, you're also, you will be also able, uh, uh, it's going to be released in August, to use WASI directly. Go is able already to compile compile to WebAssembly, but not targeting the WASI API. And this is the, the same hello word compiled using the regular go to chain. So how does WebAssembly work? So there are a number, as I said, of web different uh, runtimes that run externally from the browser, independently from the browser. And you can embed it in your application. So there's WASMTime, uh, WAMR, WASMR. And they, different, they have different strategies uh, for loading and executing WebAssembly. Um, I wanted to, like WasmTime and Wasmer, they compile the WebAssembly. I wanted to mention Wasm3 because it's lesser known. It's a C, it's a C fast, inter it's a fast interpreter written in C. Uh, but you, know, there's, you can use different strategies. I also wanted to mention the most widely known, probably, WebAssembly and JavaScript runtime, which is B8, which is a strategy called uh, tiered compilation. You load the WebAssembly module, then you decode this module and validate it. And then if it's valid, you can compile it. Now, uh, tiered compilation means that two there's basically two macro phases. The first phase compiles the module using a very quick and fast compiler called liftoff. Uh, that produces uh, native code, but not non-optimized code. But it's faster. It's very fast to produce code. So you get instantly the benefit of native code, even though it's not extremely uh, performant. Think if you have the JVM in mind, if you are familiar with the JVM, there's the C1 compiler and the C2 compiler. That's basically the same idea. And in fact, TurboFan, it's the, it's the performant compiler. Uh, it's a multi-pass optimizing compiler. And if this is from the V8 website. You can see the TurboFan has, mu has multiple phases of compilation, of analysis, and then compilation, while Liftoff is much simpler. So Liftoff boots up very fast, but it produces a bit slower code, while TurboFan uh, boots slower, generates code in a little bit more time, produces better code. So that's why you usually tier them, like because uh, TurboFan starts instantly, uh, produces code that's good enough, and then TurboFan enters uh, when your functions, for instance, runs for enough time, that it's worth it. OK. So that's the badly rendered co uh, title for Wazero. There it goes. <laughs> uh, Wazero from Tetri, I want to tell you a few words about Wazero. So uh, in mid-2020, uh, Takeshi, uh, who is the main author, uh, original author of uh, Web, uh, Wazero, um, wanted to scratch a particular itch with the WebAssembly runtime ecosystem at the time. So uh, late uh, in 2021, Tetri decided to sponsor the project with more developers. Uh, now there are three full-time developers on the project and also two external contributors that are contributing a lot of interesting stuff. The, the, the itch that Takeshi wanted to scratch was we, um, th at the time, most of the WASM runtimes, uh, when you wanted to link against them using Go, you needed to use CGO. So what's CGO? So CGO is a foreign function interface. Um, basically, it's the way you can interface your Go code against uh, native libraries. And basically, you have to do this uh, regardless of the language that you're using, uh, apart from C, C++, and Rust and some facilities. But well, <clears throat> in general, as, l as soon as you leave the space of your language and you have to link against native libraries, you have to abide to the rules of that language, which usually follows some C convention. So it's the same for Python. It's the same for Java with JNI. It's the same for Go with CGO. So what are these limitations? Well, uh, for instance, if you're familiar with Java, um, as soon as you have to link with JNI, uh, JN with JNI against uh, native code, uh, you immediately lose portability. Now you can only support the platforms for which that library can be compiled. It's pretty similar for Go. But you may say, well, but Go, it's a compiled language. What about that? So yeah, it is a compiled language. But uh, the tool chain is very powerful in that you can, I mean, I have an M1 Mac. So it's an IRM uh, CPU. And I can compile for Windows and Intel. Because the cross-compilation feature of Go are, are pretty powerful. You can basically compile for any target that's supported 
using any target that's supported. So that's pretty convenient, and it's pretty different from the usual situation when you use C and C++, for instance. So as soon as you use CGO, as soon as you link against native libraries, you have to rely on a C compiler to be available on that system, and that poses some limits. Tooling issues. You can no longer use the, the well, not for everyone, the tools that are available on the platform, like, uh, for instance, Go has debuggers, profilers, coverage, coverage tools, fuzzing tools, and runtime. So uh, as, l as soon as you interact with native code, you have to do some um, trade-offs. Like Go is famous for its Go routines, which are green threads. And these do not necessarily interact well with native threads on the platform. So you have to pay attention there. And uh, garbage collection. Uh, if you're interacting with native code and you pass a pointer to an object that's garbage collected, well, you don't have to. You, you must not garbage collect it while it's being used by the native code. Otherwise, it's no longer valid. So you have to pay attention to all of this stuff. So Wazero was born to avoid CGO, so that the uh, thing that the WebAssembly could be executed in an efficient way, but in a way that plays nicely with the rest of the Go ecosystem. So basically, as a Go developer, you can bring the dependency uh, without a second thought, because it doesn't put any burden uh, on you. So let's see how Wazero works. Wazero, again, is a Go runtime for WebAssembly. Um, and at the very least, it implements an interpreter. So uh, you, we load your WebAssembly, and we do some stuff, but then you can basically it's interpreted directly without any further compilation step. And that means that this code can run on any platform that's supported by Go. We test it on a subset of these platforms, but potentially it runs everywhere. Uh, but if you want better performance, and if you're running on MD64 or I ARM64, we also do compilation. So we do an ahead of time, load time, single pass, non-optimizing compilation of your code. And I'm going to explain all of these buzzwords uh, in case you're not familiar with all of them. So just this um, simple diagram here. On the left-hand side, you can see what happens at, at load time when you load a, a module uh, in what zero. And on the right-hand side, you see what happens when, uh, at runtime. So you see that when you load a WebAssembly binary, we decode it and we validate it. And then we compile that immediately using our compilation backend. So, and then at runtime, we won't recompile it anymore. So that's why I say it's an ahead of time compiler. Compilation happens only once and, and, and never more. So it, it's a trade off. Um, it's efficient because you only pay the cost when you load the model, and then at runtime, it won't be uh, anymore recompiled. Of course, I said also that it's an ahead of time compiler, and I also said it's a known optimizing single pass compiler. It's basically conceptually similar to liftoff in V8. We just do one pass, and we do a straightforward translation from, native co uh, from WebAssembly code to native code. Now, the trade-off um, is that, of course, the code that's generated may not be as efficient as a multipass compiler. But the good news uh, is that we're actually working on it. Actually, Takeshi is working on it. Uh, he's doing the, you know, the, the bootstrapping the compiler, doing the main uh, the work of organizing the code. And then it will be probably available very soon. And it will require a lot more work than that. Than that. It's a multi-month, multi-year kind of uh, endeavor, but it will be available soon for experimenting at the very least. Another thing, uh, another feature of WebAssembly, another uh, yeah, uh, peculiarity of WebAssembly is that it doesn't come with a garbage collector, not right now at least. There's a draft specification that's being um, stabilized as we, as we speak, but currently that's the model that you have, linear memory. What does that mean? Uh, what that means is basically you get a big array of bytes, and then there it is. You could do whatever you want, allocate, deallocate. It's all manual. You want a garbage collector? Sure, bring it. Like, compile it inside your module, but you're, we're not going to implement it for you. So that's how Go works, for instance, in WebAssembly. So it's a downside. I mean, it's a, it's a trade-off. I mean, the, the, this way the VM is very simple. Uh, on the other hand, it puts a more burden on whoever is implementing uh, the compiler. There are other limitations. You don't have support for portable threads except experimental. You don't have exception handling native inside of VM. You can do something to support it in some way. Uh, you don't have dynamic module loading. You don't have virtual calls. You can basically find ways to work around all of this. It makes the model simple. There are, there are uh, draft specifications for basically most of these features. Uh, but currently, that's uh, the current state. And you can already do pre a lot of stuff uh, with this little 
with this little support. So let's get back to this example with add and use add. Uh, so as you see, there's at the top, there's the declared function that's external. It's defining some other module. At least I, I expect this to be defining some other module. And then I have my use add function, which is actually defined within my module with proper code. So what happens uh, at runtime? How do I make available the add function? Well, um, so at the bottom, you see that we have our module that's called need add. And we have, yeah. And then we have the other module. Yeah, that doesn't really work. And, and, uh, we have the, and, and we have our add function. And this add function is calling some function called use add. This function use add is imported externally and needs to be available somehow. So the way you make available uh, this function is by providing an implementation. In the, and the way you do it, for instance, in Wazero is by defining what we call a host module. A host module is basically a virtual module that defi that's, defined in, uh, that's defined in Go code. And basically, we say, OK, the module at runtime, the WebAssembly module at runtime requires uh, some module called my host to be available, and it must define some add function, that which, which has some signature. So what I'm going to do is define that function in Go so that at runtime, then the two will be available together, and everything will work. So uh, this is what you do in Go code at the bottom. And at the bottom and at the top, you see what you would do in the browser or in Node uh, by using JavaScript as glue code. And you will define the function using JavaScript. So uh, it's not important the language that you're using. This concept basically it's uh, everywhere you want to use an external function with WebAssembly. OK, now we're uh, finally at the main meat of the talk. What, what about function compilation? How does this work? Before we get to actually see what's happening under the hood for Wazero. I'm going to give you a few more information about WebAssembly structure. WebAssembly, it's a stack machine, so just like the JVM in a, in a way. Uh, but in a different way, uh, it's different from the JVM or the .NET CIL in that um, uh, it does use a stack of values for computations. But for control flow, it doesn't use jumps and labels. It actually comes with a structure of constructs such as blocks, ifs, and loops. And that makes it pretty different, and uh, there's a reason for that. So let me give you an example for JVM bytecode that you can see on the left, and WebAssembly bytecode that you can see on the right. You will see that the, 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 this is the translation of the simple expression that you see at the top. Um, and you can see that the sequence of operation is pretty much the same at the left and on the right. Um, it's exactly the same sequence of operations. So this does not play nicely with what I just said. That's pretty different between JVM and JWASM uh, bytecode. But this is not where they are different. This is where our, they are similar, because this is just a stack of computations, stack of uh, values. The, the thing where they differ is control flow. Um, so this is WebAssembly control flow. Um, uh, sorry, this is Java, Java example of uh, if then else. And in this case, we have an if that checks for a value x. If it's true, it's uh, print 1. If it's false, print 0. Nothing fancy. But you can recognize, you don't have to pay too much attention about the code that's generated in bytecode, but you can recognize that uh, there's a jump here. This is a conditional jump. It checks for truth and then jumps to instruction 14. Uh, there's also an unconditional jump, just a go-to to instruction 21. As you can see, there's no uh, constraint on the position. It could be backwards or forwards. In this case, it's, back, it's uh, forwards, but it could be also backwards. The difference with WebAssembly uh, bytecode is that uh, we instead we have a different type of control flow uh, definition. You can see that um, this paper, Bringing the Web Up to Speed with WebAssembly, PLDI 17, it's a conference, they were recognizing that JVM and CIL, which is the .NET runtime, and Android Dalvik, with this capability of using, uh, because they are able to use labels and go-tos and uh, structured jumps, they're able to define uh, control flow structures that make the just-in-time compiler go crazy, like they generate code that is not uh, performant. And definitely, we don't want that for the web. So instead of doing that, they're using this. Uh, this is the equivalent bytecode for WebAssembly. In, and you can instantly see that there's an if block with a nested then block. And then inside the nested then block, there, are, there is a block of instructions. So there are no go-tos, there are no labels. There is proper structure inside the VM. And that makes it safer to validate, easier to validate, and uh, 
And so that's uh, one special feature of the WebAssembly machine. OK, well, let's now talk about the main compilation flow. OK, our familiar example uh, that's now rendered correctly, um, A minus B, OK, nothing fancy. Um, and as you can see, it generates this code. We're familiar with it now. Uh, by the way, you may wonder, why are you sticking with assembly script instead of using, let's say, a more familiar language like C? Well, first of all, it's not that different. Come on. Uh, but sure, let's use uh, C, for instance, with uh, Clang um, for compilation. And unfortunately, this is what it generates, so that's not perfect uh, for an example. Um, so let's stick with assembly script for now, which is pretty easy to understand. That's, uh, uh, there's a reason why C generates that code. It's pretty much the same at the end of the day, but this is easier to, to follow along. So uh, finally. What happens in Wazero? Now, this is specific to Wazero. I'm going to show some Wazero code, but it's not specific in general uh, to, to Wazero itself. I mean, uh, I'm going to show some code, but this is general, the general compilation flow that you will see in other, in other runtimes as well. So what we do, just like V8, we first load the module, we decode it, uh, so we read each bytecode instruction, each section of the bytecode, and decide whether this is valid or not. If it's not valid, error, bye. If this is valid, then we proceed to a procedure that's called compile module. This is doing an intermediate step of compilation that translates into the Wazero IR, intermediate representation. I'm going to show you that in a second. And after this step that's common between the compiler and interpreter, um, if you are on the interpreter uh, mode, will follow one path. If you are in compiler mode, will follow a different path. So let's see the intermediate representation. So this is, again, this is common for interpret and compiler. Uh, you can see, hopefully you can see on the right, uh, the example code. Um, so what we really do is go through all the possible instruction in WebAssembly, and uh, for each instruction, we see, we see a match, and we translate that instruction to another instruction in another bytecode representation, which is internal to our own um, compilation flow. So we use an internal representation for our own reasons, for uh, easiness of interpretation is a, uh, and to make it easier to compile to native code. And this is called the Wazero IR, short for Wazero Intermediate Representation. Most uh, interpreted language actually have an uh, internal IR, uh, so that's nothing fancy. Um, as you can see, some instructions are mapped to other instructions, like the WebAssembly uh, bytecode have multiple opcodes depending on the operand. Like we have opcode I32 for integer, 32-bit integer and subtraction, but you also have one for 64-bit subtraction. You have one for float, 32-bit float, da 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 da. Uh, and instead, our own internal representation has one instruction for subtraction, and then as an operand, we have the type, and that's it. And then what about interpreter mode? What happens after the, the, compu the intermediate compilation step? Uh, we iterate again over the uh, interpreted, um, the intermediate representation of code. And then basically all we do, we do some further manipulation step. We resolve the labels. And that's it. This is an interpreter mode. This is already ready to be interpreted. At runtime, we'll go through the instruction and execute them. We're done. What about compiler? Well, for compiler, we do some other, uh, some other analysis, some other, uh, some other processing. So we go to this uh, uh, compilation function, compile wasm function. It takes as an argument the intermediate representation, which is basically just a list of, uh, of op codes. And then you, you go through all of them, and then you dispatch the right compi compilation routine. Uh, and of course, in the case of sub, uh, in the case of sub, you go to compile sub, and you, you have you can have multiple implementations. In our case, we have an implementation for MD64 and one for ARM64. Now, this is not like uh, an exam up <laughs> for for glasses; you don't have to read this. But this is proper code. Uh, th this is actually code from the Go code base. You can see that it's not a lot of code, and it's not doing anything fancy. It's just deciding what to do with the operands, and then actually producing the code for the subtraction. And that's it. At the end, that's what you get. On the case of EMD, you get uh, subtraction operation. In case of ARM, you may get subtraction operation for ARM. This is not necessarily exactly the code that you get, but you get an idea. Okay? And that's it. That's for compilation. 
OK, so what about function invocation? Because that's another kind of a yeah, thing to do. Like uh, we have, so basically so far, we have read the WebAssembly codes into an array, into a, a slice, go through each instruction one by one and translated each instruction one by one into one or more uh, was zero IR instructions. And in the case of interpreter, we're done. In case of a compiler, we go again through all the was zero IR instructions and then produce multiple, usually multiple, uh, native instructions for the uh, correct CPU architecture. Now, how would you execute that? Remember uh, what we said at the beginning, uh, you, at load time we compile the module, so basically now we have covered everything on the left. Let's talk a little bit about the right. As you can see, you can instantiate your module several times, then you have exported functions. These exported functions can be invoked from your Go program, your Java pro JavaScript program, whatever. And in, uh, the exported functions are inside a table, is inside a list of functions. These functions can, can also invoke themselves. Of course, uh, functions can invoke other functions. And then you have a bunch of other things, including memory, globals, and other values that can be also exported. Go not going to throw those today. Um, and uh, so what happens when you want to execute a compile module, a compile function? Well, uh, as you recall, uh, WebAssembly is a stack-based model, stack-based model of execution. So we have to work a little bit with the stack. Uh, we have to make sure that the stack is uh, uh, correctly set up, especially when we jump into native execution. Once you, once, you have, uh, once you have done this preparation, then we can jump into the execution of native code. How do we do that? We take the, basically the array, the, the, the slice of memory where we have written the instruction, we unmap uh, the instructions into memory, and then we just jump into this huge uh, array, and then we'll just let the CPU uh, go forward with the execution. In the case of, um, yeah, and the, you know, w what we expose to the end user, it's, a, it's an interface with a call method, and they won't know what that, what's happening under the hood. This is actually how it's implemented. And for uh, the interpreter mode, we, you don't jump into native execution. You just invoke, you just enter a loop that decodes the instruction and just dispatches the semantics, and that's it. All right. So what about, um, what, about uh, what, what happens when you have execution of, um, execution, uh, during execution, you have some errors? So if you have some errors, uh, you, may, you may have to return it to the Go side. So what, what happens here is that you are in the Go space, you've written your Go program, and then you want to execute uh, a function from WebAssembly that's being compiled to native. So we do all this machinery to jump into native execution, but then you encounter an error. So what you want to do when you encounter an error is to propagate the error to the Go side so that you can handle that error. So the way this works is we invoke, uh, you invoke the function, you, we map the memory, we, you jump into the execution, and then if, as you encounter an error condition, we handle that error condition by leaving native execution with an error code. This error code is then handled on the go side. And on the go side, we decode the error and decide what to do. In general, this resolves into a panic, a runtime error. And that's it. That's how it works. Now, suppose that uh, instead you want to invoke an external function, an externally defined function, like in the example that we saw before, use add and, and, um, and add. That's actually exactly the same, uh, because uh, you, still want to, you still want to jump into the execution of the use add function, but then as soon as you want to invoke the uh, externally defined function, you need to leave native execution. So you leave native execution with a code, which is no longer an error code, but it's still some uh, code that be, can, be, can be identified. And this code represents the function that has been defined on the Go host side that we want to execute. So we return to the Go side. We, re we, we, invoke, we actually invoke the function by manipulating correctly the stack, because we have to get the arguments from the WebAssembly side to the function to the Go side, invoke the actual function with the correct arguments, and then, if the function succeeds with no errors, we return back to the native side with the correct arguments and resume execution from there. So this is surprisingly similar to what happens in native code when you have an error. 
because that's pretty much what you have to do when you have this kind of interaction between a host and a guest language. And that's it. Uh, so, yeah. And this is often called a trampoline because of this jumping back and forth. So, trampoline. Dun, 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 dun. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, that's uh, what allows you to run like Doom in the console. That's actually uh, a demo that I have. Um, you can uh, run Doom uh, in ASCII art inside the terminal using WASI, uh, which is pretty cool, but not very useful. Or you can embed your WebAssembly, uh, your WebAssembly runtime inside a program so that you can run foreign code and um, uh, in a safe environment. That's the main use case. So that's pretty much it. Um, I actually went much quicker than I, I planned, but I hope uh, you could follow along, uh, but there's a lot of time for questions. So, so what's next? Um, well, performance improvements. As I mentioned, we're working on an optimizing compiler. There's a lot of work to do there, and there will be also open uh, a, lot of time, a lot of space for contributions. Um, we're keeping track of the WASI evolution. The specification um, is kind of large. I mean, it's growing and it's evolving over time. And there's a lot of APIs that can be implemented. And we are tracking that kind of evolution because apparently that's uh, where we're heading. People are pitching WebAssembly as an alternative co to containers. And uh, that's an interesting problem space. Uh, and WASI is part of that idea. Uh, there's a lot of specification that I mentioned, like, uh, well, one that I didn't mention is tail call optimization that's in phase four, so probably a candidate for implementation, means it's very quick to stabilization. Uh, there's also the GC, uh, the GC specification that people are really looking forward to because it allows you to target a larger number of languages uh, that won't have to compile a garbage collector inside their module. One of them is uh, Kotlin, for instance. Definitely Java people are looking forward to it as well. Uh, or even JavaScript. Um, stopping resume execution, taking snapshot of the working memory to resume execution, stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff to do, and uh, we're also looking for contributors, if you'd like, uh, if you're using Go, or if you're, like, uh, or if you're just uh, wondering how a WebAssembly runtime works. Honestly, the code base is pretty clean. If, if you're, not, you're not familiar with Go, I mean, I just started in January. I used to work on J with Java. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good learning experience. So. I invite you to do it. Uh, if you'd like, you can give us a star. And of course, you can vote and give me five star for this excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Eduardo. We have plenty of people here. Any questions? Raise your hands. You're too shy. We have a pair of socks for the guy with the best question. Please, don't be shy. Yes. Oh, we have two. Thank you for a very good uh, speech, but uh, can you explain more about uh, how you solve the validation problem if they have only um, in this special uh, platform, for example, for RM? Well, uh, the validation step happens, uh, uh, is not part of the code generation part. This happens in a separate step. It happens during compilation part. So. Oh, this one. Okay, it happens here uh, uh, in the compilation phase. This is this is during uh, this is in Go space. Mm -hmm. So the way we implemented validation, we just follow the spec. The cool part about the the WebAssembly specification is that is detailed. There's a bunch of steps that you have to do to make sure that the module is valid, and you just follow them and implement them, and then you should be guaranteed they actually did some validation or so theoretical validation that should be safe. And, and that's what we do. Um, and then you're reasonably safe in running the code. For runtime error, what we do is generating traps, which are also parts of the specification. And for traps, what we do is uh, making sure, no, uh, for trap, sorry, I'm not very good with computers. Um, for traps, what we do is this jump around. So we compile uh, the validation code inside the generated code, and if there is an error condition, we, we handle it there, and we just raise the error on the go side so that people can uh, handle that on that part, because that's what you want to write. You want to, as a user, you want to write go, not native code. There was another question there. 
Hello. Uh, thank you for your topic. And uh, I have a question. Uh, can I manage or generate uh, bytecode like a uh, Java JVM? Ooh, that's a great question. He's a candidate. <laughs> so I think I have a slide for that. Let's see. So one of the things that you cannot do uh, for web in WebAssembly currently is dynamically load bytecode. So the answer is no. <laughs> but, um, well, nothing prevents you for, um, from writing a, a, a host function. So you write, let's say you're writing Go or Rust. So nothing prevents you from writing a function that you expose to your WebAssembly module in Rust, let's say. And this Rust function generates WebAssembly, and then it's being invoked by the runtime in the Rust side. So for your WebAssembly module, it's transparent, but it's not really part of the model. So you cannot do what you would do in Java, like class loading. That's, uh, it's not part of the platform. It's something that happens externally. I don't know if there's a um, proposal for that. I don't think so, because it poses probably some challenges from a security perspective. So. That's, that's definitely an interesting, an interesting problem, but no, you cannot really do that as far as I know. Okay, uh, and the second question. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you answer no, <laughs> but uh, I try. Sure. Uh, what about, uh, uh, you know about uh, Java against agents? Right. Uh, yeah, or what about uh, for WebAssemble, uh, the same tool? Or? So definitely a candidate. <laughs> okay. That's another good question. So, uh, you know, uh, Java agents actually run, in a way they run before the actual execution. So it's act there's a few interesting projects that are doing experimentations in general with bytecode, yeah, WebAssembly bytecode manipulation, um, bytecode instrumentation. And uh, you can do that. Uh, but it's again, it's not part of the model. So you could write some extension to the WebAssembly machine that allows you to plug a bytecode manipulator to transform the bytecode dynamically, or at least before execution. And that's actually one way to do, for instance, profiling uh, or some, some other sort of instrumentation. Like, for instance, people are often using WebAssembly for things like um, uh, um, blockchain, smart contracts, stuff like that. And in that case, regardless of your opinion on that, in that case, you at the very least, you want to be able to count instructions and terminate the execution after a while, uh, or if you reach the gas count, you know. And that could be done, for instance, by rewriting the bytecode. And you can do that at load time. So I wanted to skip quickly to, this, uh, to these slides. This, uh, this is a profiler that's written on top of Wazero because I wanted to mention, you know, bytecode instrumentation. There are things that you can do externally. And this is how uh, they did, uh, this is how they did it for, for Wazero. This is actually an extension to Wazero from some people, really cool people that are committers and work with us. And uh, the way they did it, they are, I wanted just to show you the link if possible. Anyway, it's called WZProf. It's written on top of a zero. The way it, oh, there you go. The way it works, uh, the way it works, uh, basically we have some hook points inside a VM to attach listeners that gets invoked uh, during function invocation. And by doing that, you can also walk the stacks. And by walking the stacks, uh, you can also look at profiling information, like how many times that function was invoked, uh, the stack trace and all that that otherwise you couldn't do, uh, you wouldn't be able to do normally in WebAssembly. And that way you get a, a, a profiler for WebAssembly. And that's, I think that's some of the uh, tools for, for, for Java uh, using uh, use agents for. And uh, that's actually pretty cool stuff. Uh, it allows you to use Go tooling for do profiling. So you use Go pprof, Go tool pprof to do compilation, uh, prof profiling. So that's uh, general generic Go tooling that uses prof under the hood. So it's pretty cool. Other questions? Here we have one. Hi, thanks for the talk. I want to ask you about your thoughts about uh, Thresh proposal, this proposal on a phase three right now, and is it make sense to implement it in uh, runtime, go runtime? Uh, which one? Threads, Threads proposal. Threads, okay, that's a good question. Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, uh, yeah, we have another candidate. Yeah. Um, so, Threads is, is actually in phase three. 
so the, these uh, specifications, in case you guys don't know, the rest of the people on the audience don't know, these uh, proposals go through a series of phases. There's four phases and then the final phase. So it's five, really. Um, and when you get to, to the fourth stage, basically, it's pretty much ready for implementation. So three, it's just a little bit before that. So as a policy, we don't really want, we, have a, we are a very tiny team and we don't want to rush into implementing stuff. But actually, like last month, we, have, we had one, another of our external contributors that used to work with us and our same team, uh, some, um, same company, uh, that wanted to implement threads and he started to implement it uh, on, on the interpreter side. Unfortunately, we had to revert the commit. I mean, he decided to revert the commit. It's not like, we revert your commit. Because unfortunately, uh, the specification didn't cover all of the cases, apparently, or at least we weren't able to understand. Uh, I mean, we didn't get enough coverage uh, to understand what, where we were going wrong. And so the, the test cases were flaky and it was just unreliable. So we tried. Uh, definitely that's a good candidate for, uh, you know, for being implemented in the future. It's gonna be a mess because it's not just about threads. It's also about uh, atomic uh, memory um, loads and stores. Just like the GC, uh, GC spec, it's not just about garbage collection, but also about memory layout. Uh, the names are sometimes a bit funny. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a bit painful, but it could be it's a definitely a useful feature. For instance, if you want to port JVM code, people do some assumptions about the ability to run threads. Whoa. Please turn on the mic. Okay, so uh, since browser has some constraints on a harder level, like we can talk about memory, CPU constraints, uh, anything that is set by the operating system. Is it possible to somehow hack those constraints inside the WebAssembly? Well, ideally, no, uh, but I'm not a security expert. So <laughs> take uh, this the question is, is there are some holes? Well, there must be some holes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So um, in conceptually, the WebAssembly module is very simple and limited. Uh, if you don't consider WASI, which is the set of specific, the set of APIs that allow you to give access to your system, to your machine, you have an extremely fancy calculator. So <laughs> you cannot really interact with your system. Maybe if the um, compiler, if you have a native compiler that compiles the WebAssembly code into native, uh, if the generated code is faulty, maybe you could do some, I don't know, denial of service or something. Uh, but um, otherwise, the attack surface is pretty small because basically you cannot do anything unless you expose it directly to your WebAssembly module. That's why uh, the WASI uh, specification is interesting. Uh, right now, most uh, implementation, most uh, runtimes do not come with a lot of APIs to let you interact with the system, or at least uh, it's not very standardized. It's not. It's not there's no common uh, interface apart from WASI. So any implementation, any custom implementation may have bugs. So for instance, Envoy has its own set of APIs that allow you to interact with a proxy. That depends on the APIs that you provide and how safe you have implemented those. But in general, the model itself should be sim safe because it's very limited and simple. Now, as you implement more specification and more, as more specification become available and, and mandatory maybe to implement, that could change. But currently, I think it's kind of safe. We have time for one more question. We have a question uh, here. Yeah. There was uh, one there. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the structured control flow is somewhat superior to what, for example, JVM and .NET runtime do. On the other hand, uh, their JITs do, I would say, pretty, mu pretty much a good job uh, at uh, compiling the code at runtime. So my question is, are there any specific code patterns that potentially would allow uh, WASM to execute faster than similar code uh, compiled, uh, if it was compiled, for example, in GVM? Um, that's a good question, but honestly, I don't have a specific answer to that. Um, uh, the 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 main issue. 
So um, the, the reference that I can bring you is this paper here that tells us uh, they did the research, so the blame is on them. <laughs> Um, they say that, for instance, from the validation point of view, which also answers another question that someone posed uh, earlier. Um, so verification, it's pretty complicated for the JVM, for instance, and it's pretty easy to trip up the, the verifier uh, to, to, generate, for, to generate bad code on the one end and also to make it very slow. Like it takes 150 pages to describe on the JVM specification while fits in a page for WebAssembly. So I guess they have examples. So if you're interested, probably this paper have some of the answers. And similarly for just-in-time compilation, probably they have some examples of, I don't remember, honestly, I have, I have read, read this paper well, a while ago. Uh, they probably have some examples of um, pathological cases that you can look at. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And Unfortunately, we're up on time. Sorry. So, Greba was speaker. I encourage you to do this. He was pinned for 15 minutes to the stage. You can pin him in the discussion zone. Uh, who gave the best question? Oh, I like his answer. His okay. Questions. So, our hero, our, our hero, a round of applause, please. <laughs> and. Another round of applause for our lovely speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for the organizer. They are excellent. Great selection of talks, and not just because I spoke.